Today on Locked On Phoenix Suns, Team USA scores a big win in their Olympic opener, led by who else? Devin Booker and Kevin Durant. Why those two dominating was a sight for sore eyes and probably how it's going to go the rest of the tournament. Let's go. You are Locked On Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we're back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brendan Clean, as well as a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past seven seasons. Welcome in. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen right after the buzzer of Team USA versus Nikola Jokic and Serbia. Hit follow or subscribe if you have not already. We're free and available on all podcast platforms including YouTube, hit that button, get a new episode in your feed Monday through Friday, become an everydayer, get locked on to the Phoenix Suns all offseason long and beyond here on the show. We'll get to Book and KD bombing away from deep, efficient gods, we'll just say, and then some Team USA observations before circling back on the biggest news of the weekend, which was Tyus Jones coming in to the Valley. Today's episode brought to you by the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app, create an account, Use the code locked on NBA when you make your first purchase to get $20 off. Terms apply. More from them later on in the show. Joining us as he does every single Monday is Brandon Duenas, a writer over at Bright Side of the Sun. And Brandon, it might seem like a weird place to start, but I got to say, watching Book and KD get up 10 threes total, that excited me more than any moment in this entire game. That excited me more than any component of this entire game. After a whole year of pulling our hair out, wondering why those guys weren't taking more of those shots, it just felt perfect to see them do it today. You are not alone, my friend. I that was my takeaway as well, and a lot of people at, just on online, uh, I think, had that same takeaway. Like nine of ten from three combined, that's twenty-seven points on ten shots. Uh, they scored thirty-five points on fifteen shots combined. Like that is unheard of. Um, the efficiency between those two, and like now that we have which we'll get to Tyus Jones and Monty Morris to table set and really put them in a position to hit those threes and catch and shoot situations. Like coach bud is licking his chops right now. This is what they need. They need the high volume threes and team USA more importantly today needed it uh, after a tough fight uh, against Serbia early on. And they obviously pulled away late, but a lot of that was due to, to Kevin Durant keeping them afloat. Uh, so it was just fun to watch. Yeah, this KD saga has been fascinating, I think, to say the least. He misses all of the exhibition games. There's some uncertainty around what the checklist is for him to return. Is it Steve Kerr just sort of dragging his feet? Is it them just saying, hey, it's Kevin Durant. He's done this literally more than anybody in the history of this team. Why do we need to waste him in an exhibition in London against South Sudan rather than just saving him for Paris? But he gets the clearance to play and like he always does whether you're talking about the 2019 or really the foot injury 10 years ago the calf injury leading into the finals in 2019 before the achilles when he's actually awesome in that game coming back from the achilles the year the suns made the finals and looking like an mvp all nba candidate again to now or the ankle last year he always just does this where if you were to turn on the game today and you hadn't been following the news, you'd be like, wait, which guy was hurt? Who is the guy that's coming back from injury? All I know is that guy's the best player on the court. I don't know anything else about his health or his 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 physical status. And he piles it in 23 points, like you said, on nine shots. Just I know it's a lot of attention has been on LeBron and 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 rightly so from a age standpoint, but I think KD reminded everybody that uh, he's defying father time a little bit as well in Paris. Yeah, you put that pretty well. Like, I think LeBron obviously is going to get that attention, but Captain America really, if you look at the history of Team USA and all the stints and longevity and just resume, Kevin Durant really is Captain America. And he, he reminded us of that again today. And like you said, just no, no rust at all. Like, it just looked like he just... You know, it was a pretty seamless return. He fit right into his his role. And I think that's what's exciting about 
getting these going back to like the sun specific side of it is getting these playmakers to kind of take that pressure off of him. I think it's going to help put him in situations like we saw today with team USA, where he doesn't really have to work too hard to get to his spot. He'll just kind of get there within the flow of the offense. So I think there's a lot of par- like parallels uh, there. And then hopefully with on Booker's side as well, just playing, buying into being that, that role player um, like Don Staley called him the, the quiet assassin of, of, of the group after the, the game. And I thought that was a great uh, little, like he, he got a lot of flowers too from D Wade as well. But I thought uh, Durant's ability to just hit shots uh, just over people in tough contests is just like nothing new. It's like what we've seen from him uh, time and time again. And it just looked like he didn't miss a beat. So it was, it was fun to watch. It was funny to watch some of the players, playmakers on this team, I think, have to have the reminder of get him the ball, which we've seen throughout KD's career because, you know, he is that kind of silent assassin. He's not the pound it, initiate every play type of guy. He doesn't necessarily want to be. And we all saw that at, you know, watching the Suns team last year where the coaching staff, the players on the court didn't seem to really have a, that that preternatural hey instinct let's get him the ball he's hot let's 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 keep feeding him but this team i think figured it out maybe you know helpful yeah. that obviously a lot of high iq guys but also steve kerr you know he he knows a thing or two about how to keep the uh keep the beast going but i had this these stats pulled up first of all it's crazy that i always forget that KD wasn't on the redeem team like they keep citing that stat of you know fourth Olympics and I'll, I'm like why only four I, I still don't really get it when I look at the fact that like you know Michael Red, Carlos Boozer, Tayshaun Prince like <laughs> how did KD not make that team it's it's crazy to think but this is what he's done every single Olympics he's basically averaged 20 points a game in every single Olympics that he's ever played in and he looks well on his way to doing that again yeah and I think just uh going back to the top of it just obviously the longevity and like having the experience, I think that's part of what makes it the process so seamless for him to fit in kind of any environment really when it comes to it. And like, there's going to be some chemistry issues you would think where it'd be like, yeah, that they don't know when to get him the ball and all that. They've been practicing together. Um, He's been slowly worked back into it. So I think they're still going to have to kind of figure out a way to incorporate him in the offense. Uh, it's a lot easier when you're making every shot you take, like it's, it's, it's obviously going to make things easier in that transition process, but he didn't, he wasn't in those fights with them against uh, South Sudan and in Germany. And like, I think those like this game today was just a great way for them to get some reps uh, against a tough team that, um, you know, put up a fight. And I I do have some beef with them that, that foul on Micic, that should have been a, a flagrant. Like, I don't know what we're doing here. They just like, Pretty much. Yeah, it felt inconsistent today for sure. Where some of like even there was a uh, the block that KD had on the left corner in the second half on Jovic, yeah, felt very similar to the one that they did call on Curry. So even that, it's like obviously that kind of went Team USA's way to not get that call on Durant, obviously. But it, there were a lot of examples where I'm like, what is the baseline here? What like what yeah. we got to get some we got to get some film sent out to this ref crew after this one to let them know. <laughs> And look, don't get me wrong. I love physical play. I think there's a lot of stuff that you should let go, like especially the flopping. I think FIBA refs do sure. a great job Agreed. of ignoring the flops. But when it comes to like the but keep it consistent, stuff, exactly, yeah, keep it consistent. That's all we ask for. Um, yeah. But yeah, just getting back to your point about Durant, I thought just overall, just his experience is really what showed up. And and when you're that tall and you could shoot over people and not really see them, uh, it's a perfect environment for him. That's why we saw like a stretch four, like quote unquote stretch four, like Carmelo Anthony when. For Team USA, his role kind of changed a little bit, and he excelled. So I think players in that prototype, their game translates super well to this level, and it's Kevin Durant. I feel like he just had to kind of remind everyone who he is. Um, and watching him and LeBron do this at their eight, respective ages is just crazy. It's still mind-blowing to me. Yeah, it is it's it is insane. I mean, I the, the three-point kind of floor spacer mold that you're talking about that Melo had to kind of settle into, like, you know, KD's three point attempts per game in the Olympics have been around six, seven, eight, which is just more than he's really taken in his NBA career. So that shows up. But I thought their ball movement was also just good. I think, in particular, Bam, LeBron, and Derek White, when those guys were out there, they really kept the ball moving. Book two, but, um, you know, 
when it can drive kick, you know, go around the horn and then end up in an open three, I think that's when this team's at their best. And the Suns just happen to have two of the guys that they're trying to get it to at the end of those sequences to complete those plays. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we'll get to the bigger picture on the team. But last thing on the Suns, guys, when KD come and now that he's back, when he gets back into the starting lineup, does Book go to the bench or does Drew Holiday go to the bench? That's that's a tough one. I I feel like the team team USA coaching staff loves Book. Um, they love Drew as well. So that's that's really going to come down to who they trust more. Point of attack, which I think Book's been awesome defensively, but the just the track record of Drew, like I would give him an edge on that standpoint. But honestly, if they they might just keep it the same, like they could just have a bench with where they trot out Anthony Davis, Kevin Durant, and. Uh, Anthony Edwards like it's just it's such a nice luxury to have so I don't really think it matters who starts yeah. honestly like it's just about rhythm and finding a good rhythm for all these guys and Booker also just last thing I'll hit on with book was like that stretch where they really put that game away when it was like a 10-2 run and Booker was involved in every play hit a three had an assist yeah. hit another three had another assist so that was like four possessions in a row that his fingerprints were all over so I thought he was he quietly had a very effective game without really dribbling like he, he really didn't uh, yeah I, I mean he probably had more points than dribbles honestly you mentioned the coaching staff loves him the players clearly trust him too I think especially LeBron you know LeBron found him yeah. for the two threes he made in the first quarter and then down the stretch like you said they're not worried they're not seeing him as you know, any kind of, obviously he's 27, but like, you know, compared to some of these dudes, he is the young guy, but nobody's treating him that way, you know, and mm -hmm. um, he's just making the right play just like everybody else. And, and I think he just fits in really, really well, which is why we came up with the Olympic book name four years ago and why we all figured he'd play a prominent role this year, kind of no matter what, starting minute wise rotation whatever it looked like we kind of just trusted he's gonna break in and he definitely did but let's get to the bigger team uh thoughts here after beating serbia a team that frankly if anyone's gonna beat them serbia would have been one of the ones that you thought could do it and they just got blown out so let's discuss coming up next First, today's show brought to you by Game Time, the best place to buy any ticket, as well as an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app even go down the closer that you get to first pitch. The D backs had a nice past couple of months. They appear to be buying more than they are selling. Is there another pennant run in our future? I know I'm not wearing a D backs hat. I'm sorry, but it is what it is. I am going to be booking, uh, buying some tickets for when my friend from out of town comes in around mid to late august going to be checking out what's going on and i will be using game time because i love it they have deals for every occasion every place every price every tier they also have the all-in pricing up front as well as views from your seat which means transparency another thing that i hate about a lot of other places to buy tickets game time fixed it fixed it they say here's fully what you're paying even if it's you know obviously a little higher than face value you still know you're not surprised at the end and you're not surprised by what your seats are when you actually get to the venue you get what you're paying for you know what you're paying for and you take the guesswork out of buying mlb tickets as well as comedy concerts theater and more with game time download the game time app now create an account use the code locked on nba to get 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account redeem the code l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n-n-b-a locked on nba for 20 dollars off download game time today last minute tickets Lowest price, guaranteed. All right, Brandon. So I don't even think I said the final score. 110 to 84. Team USA beats Serbia. Nikola Jokic did have 28 and 5, but we've seen this from, from Jokic before. If we if you've watched the playoffs, obviously the Suns went up against him in the second round. If he doesn't think the team has a chance, especially when he's not on the court, we don't see him go into full-on attack insane mode and and that's kind of what happened here they got crushed when he was off the court and every time he came in it felt like they were down double digits and i think in the second half we really just saw serbia kind of roll over frankly and team usa just hit the gas and you mentioned that stretch in the fourth quarter i have a hard time imagining 
that this isn't how it goes most games because the thing about this crazy stacked Team USA roster is, yes, we can talk about who should start and the star power, but like you were kind of saying there with the KD side of it, if he were to just stay coming off the bench, Team USA's bench would be the best team in this tournament, and it's just going to be hard for these other squads to stack up with that, that reserve unit when they're non-NBA players when they're non-good you know great players guys we've never heard of overseas come into the game and still are getting walloped by all those crazy all-star all-NBA guys you mentioned I, I think this is going to be the recipe we see a lot of nights in this uh in this Olympics yeah for sure and, and starting down 10 to 2 to start the game like they, they faced some adversity and like it looked like it was going to be a dog fight uh, to the end, which a lot of times in these games are tough to go on runs, but I think team USA's talent just outweighs to where they could really go like turn it up a notch and just put teams out quick. But I think their biggest challenge will be when they get on those runs or build like a, a 10 point lead or something, keeping the gas, uh, like keeping the foot on the gas. Cause that, that's the biggest thing is like a lot of these teams, they will fight back. Like they're fighting for their countries. Like we've seen role players in the NBA just look like absolute all-stars on their it's like the the country effect. So uh, there's just a different level of pride and like just the way the game is played. So I think their biggest challenge is going to be learning how to, with this group, uh, build their leads and maintain them and keep them going because point differential matters. That's why for anyone watching out, they kind of explain other broadcasts, but that's why Steph was pulling up, hitting that last second shot. He's like, you never know if those points are going to matter. So I think uh, I, I love that. I think, I wish the NBA adopted that in a way so people would stop getting butt hurt over uh, teams shooting late in games. But, but, but yeah, I think overall USA's talent is uh, undeniably uh, the best in the world. Uh, the, the gap is closing though. And like the Serbian team, like if you put them in the Olympics, like, you know, in, in the, in the nineties or early two thousands with this group, like they'd, you can make a case. They'd have like probably one of the best rosters. So uh, it's just a different, era now so that's that's the toughest part about comparing eras when everyone talks about like this is the greatest team of all time like i think so like they're pl they're also facing the greatest competition they've ever faced so it's it's going to look a little yeah. different so that's that's my main, main takeaway is like you could have all the talent in the world but the chemistry the continuity and like the, the pride that these teams play with is just uh you can see it like they're they're fighting uh it's just like the desperation like it's it's fun to watch man like just as a basketball fan. It's an it's a, a entirely different style of basketball, really. It's an entirely different style. It's also, I agree, it's it's very fun to just see. I mean, it's it's what we all kind of like dream up when you're a kid, like liking the sport. Like, what if those guys, how could those guys fit? What is that? You know, it, it it's just like answering all those questions. And it's been a while. It's been since 2008 that I think we felt like the Team USA had a team with this level of top to bottom talent. Obviously they've won gold every time, but you know, especially in 2021, it was not the top of the top. And, but I still just look at the, I think they could still face difficult games. I don't think that I like your point about the runs and everything. Like I could see a world where they, you know, they were up like 18 before Serbia made a little push or maybe like 20 and then they cut it to 15 or 12 at one point. And then that, that run you said book kind of was a big part of really put the game away. I could see a world where maybe there's a game that they're up like 10 in that spot. And then the other team's run comes and suddenly, you know, you have crunch time, but I just don't see a complete, I don't see another complete team in this bracket, right? Like France defensively, I do think could give team USA some trouble because of the presence of Vic and Gobert together and some of their other, you know, wings, but they don't have enough guard offensive creation that I think they can keep up. Germany has the depth, they're physical. They gave Team USA trouble in the in the World Cup, but I don't think that they have enough size at, at the big spots forward and center. Canada has no rim protection without Zach Eady and just, you know, with some of the undersized Dwight Powell, Trey Lyles guys that they have out there and kind of on down the line from there. I just, I don't think that I see a team that can compete with the athleticism and the creation. And look, that's not a surprise. We just were saying this might be one of the better teams ever, ever in the history of basketball. But now watching them, it's going to be really hard for me to envision a world where they don't 
win this whole thing. And and I don't know how hard the test will truly be. Maybe that's an overreaction after one game, but it's it's hard to envision. Yeah, I think I think there's definitely going to be a challenge at some point, and it's going to come like uh, as great as LeBron is. There, like everyone's if he has an off game, like he's the engine of that team. How are they going to respond if? if he's struggling, uh, who's going to take, is it going to be ant? Is it going to be KD? Like, who's going to take that? Um, I guess offensive burden, like it's, it's going to happen. There's going to be a game foul trouble injuries, whatever. So I think France to me is like probably the most, um, intimidating team just because of the style of this play is like a lot different. It's a lot slower. Their size can really, I think, disrupt what the U S likes to do and of getting to the interior. And like, they might have to settle for jumpers. And if those aren't falling, the game really shrinks. So I feel like that's, that's going to be a team that will give them fits. But like you said, they don't really have that uh, guard, like, or like even wing. I mean, they have like Fournier and like some guys that can play, but they don't really have that punch that the U S has. So I feel like that's yeah, a lot be a of these other challenge. teams have their guards are old now, right? Yeah. It's kind of a weird moment in international basketball outside of Canada, who has all these guards that are now coming up, but no, bigs, like Australia, yeah. you would have said Patty Mills, right? Like Spain, Rubio used to kill you. Germany, Schroeder's not old. He just won FIBA World Cup MVP. But, you know, um, France with DiColo and uh, and Fournier. And it's just a, a moment where a lot of those guys that would have burned you aren't really there. But I agree, right? Like, I think that's another pathway to it. The injuries, the foul trouble or anything, of course. But if, the, if Team USA gets cold from deep and their opponent gets hot, that's a blueprint, right? And there's teams that could do that to you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in this group, uh, so it's, I, I feel pretty confident the U.S. will, will get past this group. Like I, I'm not bearing some weird stuff happening. Like it's, uh, we, we can kind of circle past that at this point. But I think uh, there will be a game. I don't know if it's going to be a group play or not, but there's going to be a game where they start slow and they're in trouble. And like, uh, when teams have momentum in this environment, it's really easy to uh, for that to keep pushing forward and like keep leads going. So I think uh, their their biggest thing is just going to be mental. Really, if they can withstand some punches and like a cold shooting, like to me, their path to gold is is really in their hands at this point. So it's it's fun yeah. to be a, t a fan of a team that's the heavy favorite. Like I'm not used to this. So every four years, it's it's nice to get this. Uh, so, so we'll take that, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see how they respond and just the international play in general has been, uh, really fun to watch. Like South Sudan has been awesome. That upset over Puerto Rico and, um, yeah. you know, that's, there's just so, there's just so much Jose Alvarado. I know Suns fans don't want to hear that, but uh nice game. Yeah. You can, yeah. you might need to delete that. <laughs> <laughs> These Olympics, uh, the Olympics period every year from a basketball standpoint, they're like a reminder of when you have that debate if you have not been so lucky as to cheer for a team that was some kind of super team or anything and you're like would you like it would it be would it get old like the chiefs right now or any sort of dynasty or anything the patriots the yankees whatever and then you're like oh i don't know it might not be it might get old no uh it doesn't mm -hmm. i would glad says about how the Suns felt about last year's team, how Bud felt about how this team needed to evolve, and whether it's all just going to be crumpled up and thrown in the trash. So let's get to that side of the Tyus deal next. All right, Brandon, so let's keep it rolling here. Tyus Jones, give me your thoughts Big picture on this. Obviously a no-brainer to get a player that good on a minimum contract, but what's your general read? What's lingering on your mind after that deal and what it kind of means for the season we're about to watch? Yeah, so just zooming out entirely, just big picture thinking of, like this is why having money and having an owner that wants to spend and putting yourself in these situations matters. Like we've been talking about it a lot in the past of like, we're going to eventually, the Suns are going to be an attractive free agent destination. And we haven't really had the chance to like display that really in terms of like landing anyone that 
shouldn't be i mean eric gordon's kind of an example last year where he had more money on the table but obviously that didn't really pan out but i think tyus jones obviously is worth uh more than a minimum and him coming here speaks to the the statement he gave to to espn just of like how he sees this as a great opportunity and like it's a team that wants to win uh whenever you don't have as much depth as uh, some of these other teams do like there's opportunity for minutes. So I think that perfect storm, uh, the stars kind of aligned and they got a player that, that I think is going to help them out a lot. Like between him and Morris, they have two of the best assist to turnover ratio guys in, in the league and all those frustrating turnovers we saw last in year. The history of the league. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's actually mind boggling. So anytime the Suns turn the ball over on the court this year is going to be an upset. <laughs> like and I know there's like that. live in-game betting. I'm going to bet on not a turnover every single possession on this team that it, like yeah. they should never do it. And they'll have at least one, most likely like, I mean, they're going to have some moments where maybe one of those two are not on the court, but most of the time, one of those two guys will be on the court uh, making the decisions for the offense. And I think that's going to do wonders for like, uh, because neither of them really need to score. They can, if they need to, but like they're in primary focus is to get stars and get other players involved and get the right shot every possession. And I think that's, that's huge. Uh, getting a t two table setters that are just excellent decision makers. Uh, they're both, I think a little bit better than people give him credit for defensively, especially Tyus. Like he's really good in the passing lanes and obviously he's undersized and that he'll get exposed in some playoff situations for sure. But I think perimeter wise, like he's, he's going to, surprise some people like he makes some defensive plays and he was on a bad Washington team now I think uh we saw in Memphis I thought back when he was a back one of the best both these guys were considered like the best backup point guards in the league like at different times and I think uh the defensive activity is going to surprise some people like I think he, he's going to make an impact there um even if he does get picked on and by uh bigger wings or whatever but overall I, yeah. I love it I think it's a great Great addition, no brainer. Bring in as much talent as you can, figure everything else out later. Yeah, 41, 38, and 42% on catch and shoot threes the past three seasons for Tyus Jones, right in line with how good Monte Morris is at that. So, definitely players that are going to be initiating and starting possessions, helping with the pace, helping cut down on the turnovers and be floor generals, but also players where if the ball moves, there's drive and kick situation or they they do spot up in the corner on any given possession you can trust that they're also going to knock down that shot when they're open which is what you have to do two things to follow up there on though that you said that i think lead us into the question that we're trying to answer here which are one you said this sun situation their relative lack of depth means that they have minutes to offer players like tyus jones I didn't think that was the case. And I said that yesterday. I started the whole reaction podcast by saying I was wrong because I had done another episode earlier in the week saying I don't think the Suns are going to be able to make a deal or be appealing enough to a player like Tyus or a couple other guys that I talked through to cut David Roddy and make this whole kind of domino down from cutting Roddy worth it. Just not, I, I don't think that they're going to be able to to offer that to anybody and have it have it work out but obviously he's going to start here now and then you said there might be minutes with him on the court might not so my question is do you think that the Suns did this because they think they thought that they needed a starting point guard for sure and they like went you know had Tyus Jones at the top of the whiteboard from June whatever on and finally got their guy or do you think this was sort of an opportunity knock situation where he's lingering, he's there? Hey, bud, how would you feel if we did have a point guard on the court all the time? How would that change things? What do you think about that? How could we make it work? Whatever. And then they just said, yeah, we kind of would be dumb not to do this and we'll change our team around as a result of it. Which direction do you think it came from? Because I think that tells us a lot about what will come now that he's on the team. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Like, I, I'm, I would be willing to bet that they probably reached out to him the minute they could legally, hopefully, um, legally without tampering, to see if there's interest. Um, just doing their due diligence. Like, if look, we got we got a spot for you. If it doesn't work out, if you don't get what you're looking for, like we we have a starting spot open for you. Like, just putting a feeler out there, let the process play out. And it was it's that's part of the advantage of this offseason being so slow. Like everyone complained about. There's just not a lot of money to spend in certain 
uh, positions and certain players that I think, especially at point guard, like there is an overflow at this point. So even like Markel Fultz is still out there. Like there's, there's some good players that are probably going to sign for less than they hope for. So I think the Suns goal entering the offseason is definitely to get at least one quality point guard that can make decisions like a Morris, uh, probably more realistic. That's probably like their priority, but Tyus, I don't think they had the expectation that he was going to take that cut. Um, but there's, yeah. they're probably hoping in the back of their minds, like this would be a great fit. I know they've been like loosely linked to him in the past. So I think, uh, it, the fit makes sense. Uh, I think it's, it's a, a no brainer on, on a vet minimum. Like it's, uh, but the direction of the team definitely shifts, I think, which is what you're getting to is like, is this what their vision was with, with this team is like going from zero point cards to basically like two elite decision maker type that kind of yeah going to where you ball. could have 48 minutes of point of like legit yeah. small floor general point guards on the court that's like it couldn't yeah. be more different from how they were last year where they had a lot of minutes uh, most minutes with none of that guy yep they had and grace and allen initiating offense last year you know Saban Saban lee like there's people forget <laughs> like i mean obviously depth depth matters a lot okay like there's going to be minutes it's going to work out like it's going to happen where there's going to become a point in the season where these guys are getting uh they're all happy with minutes like it's unless it's a perfect world everyone stays healthy then that's a good pro problem to have and i'm here for it so uh, to me like you just got to let things play out and i think the rotation will kind of settle in as uh as the season goes on so i think to me like there's always going to be minutes um it might not be perfect yeah, right i, mean, off I think the, the guys I think the wings are who's going to get burned on minutes yes. because yeah, I agree. Like the guards have the pedigree and the salary that they're all going to play. I think they're not going to get squeezed and you might see minutes mm. with a lot of small guys on the court together, but the issue is yeah. going to be Ryan Dunn, Josh Kogi, whatever those, that Damian Lee, like that's, those are the yeah. players who like a month ago thought, Hey, I might be like, you know, eighth man on this team. And now they're like the 12th man. Yeah. And that's, that's why you can't overreact to any, like that Kogi contract. Like, I think people would probably assume that it, I really don't think it had anything to do with like what they thought of him as a player. It's more of like a trade chip and like, yes, they need some, some defense and energy, like whatever. But like now he's buried, the rookies are kind of buried. Like it's, it's a, that domino effect of like, if we don't trust our wings to come in and play, like that Utah and KBD and like all these guys that met to last year, would you rather have one of those guys play or someone that's proven and go a little bit smaller yeah to, and to me like that's that's their directions like just collect good basketball yeah. players and figure everything else yeah. out after that in the regular season talent can get you where you need to go right like you can yeah. be you can put a lot of very good players on the court even if they don't fit together perfectly in mm -hmm. terms of like you know looking exactly like last year's celtics or something mm -hmm. the perfect postseason team and you're still going to be very very good win a lot of games teams do not game plan to attack those weak points in your roster in your rotation in your play style nearly as much as they do in the playoffs so like what i, I i've called it flexibility first i've called it a floor high floor off season i think all of that is right it'll help them a lot in the regular season but i guess my question to close it, us out on kind of the big picture of it is do you what what do you think is going to be the best closing lineup this team can roll out it, is it going to be with tyus jones or do you think that there's still a possibility that the original vision for how this big three could play which was a little more spontaneous a little bit less um traditional can still win out and be the best version of this team where do you see that going yeah, it's it's tough because I think Tyus will elevate. Um, he complements the players really well, I think. But at the same time, the size issue, like the rebounding, the defense, like that comes into play as well. So closing lineups, like it's really, I feel like he's going to have to be, um, it's going to be situational for sure. So like if he's having a strong game and Coach Bud feels confident in closing with him, like I, I think he will. But I feel like they have so many options now and that's what you need. Like speaking to the depth, like in the regular season, I think that helps come playoff time too, because your guys aren't as taxed uh, trying to pick up the slack to win those regular season games. So um, yeah. closing lineups, I'm not even going to like sit here and try to predict what it's going to be because honestly, I think it's going to change every game. Like, and that's a good and bad thing. I think you could look at it both ways. Um, 
but hopefully I think come it playoff will time. Early. Yeah. yeah, I think it will. I, I think the whole roster will look different come playoff time. I mean, that that to yeah. me seems pretty certain at this point. So I agree. Like, I'm not going to, neither of us can possibly predict what the closing lineup of game one of the first round is going to be or anything. But mm -hmm. I think you might be right that it changes a little bit early in the regular season. I would say by like, you know, January 1st, you want to have a good idea of, of what you are. And yeah, to me, that probably still, I just still think that that's going to include somebody like Royce, Royce O'Neal as the fifth guy. But that's part of what's so interesting and, and cool about the way that they've operated is, like you said, they give themselves a lot of options. They can be different every night. They can, you know. So they'll, they'll probably go into training camp ready to the coaching staff ready to kind of be surprised by how things play out. I, I think it'll be good to yeah. just let it let it develop, let guys compete, let guys prove themselves rather than saying this is what our team is, this is what our team has to be. But I still just think the needs of this team. We saw 82 games of it last year. Tyus Jones is a part of that solution. Monte Morris is a part of that solution. A lot of the guys they added can be parts of that solution, but. I still just think we kind of know what you need around Book Beal and KD. And even getting a player as good as Tyus, who I didn't say this yesterday, I haven't said it yet today, I keep meaning to, John Hollinger had him as a $14 million player going into free agency. Like, it's a hell of a value. He's an awesome player. Like I said, he'll be great in the regular season. But I still just think that piece isn't on the roster yet of the perfect... If you have a big and the big three, what's that fifth piece? I'm not sure it's there yet, but that's okay, right? It's, I'm not saying that as a negative. I just think that's going to be part of the fun of the season is mm -hmm. does that player suddenly look like, okay, wow, no, it actually is a guy that's here, or where does the trade market and everything else kind of take them? But now they have the opportunity to at least like learn those lessons rather than just having to force it like you said they did last year with all those names. Exactly. Now they're built to withstand a, a Booker or Beal injury where if one of those guys goes down last year, there was kind of like the world was ending this year. I think in the regular season, they could still win games with, uh, you know, plug in whoever like that guard rotation is very deep. And I think that alone is going to help not only on the basketball court in that sense, but just when the trade market starts to heat up a little bit, like is a Grace and Allen more expendable is, uh, you know, just, I think because now that they have that depth, they can get a little more creative with how they look at the trade market. So I think there's like a ripple effect of the on-court stuff. Yes, they still don't, there's not going to be that perfect player. They probably won't acquire it, that perfect player uh, given their limitations. But I think uh, anytime you have a chance to add value at that price, like it's just, you have to do it yeah. and just try to roll with the punches and, and see if you could figure out what the best closing lineup is, which honestly for a team trying to win a championship and win playoff games, like, that's the most important thing. Like we can talk about depth all we want, but like, what is their best five? Can they close out games and win? And I don't really care what it looks like. They just, that's what they have to figure out. Um, it, will Tyus Jones be included? I think he can be in, at times, but yeah. uh, there, it really depends on. You know, I mean, the, the, the look in Memphis. Yeah. In Memphis, it went under the radar a lot, but consistently their best lineups had Ja and Tyus on the court and they would play those two together more in the playoffs than in the regular season because I mean you know Bain was a different guy back when the last time Ja was healthy we don't need to turn this into a Grizzlies podcast but like the point is he's an experienced guy who has made teams better even despite his weaknesses for a long time. And and I don't think that will change. And like you said, he has some value on both ends, even if he is 6'1". So yeah, it's, it's a great signing. It should be really fun to see how it all plays out. And I think it's too early to say a lot of those things, but it was a good thought experiment nevertheless. That'll wrap us up. Hit follow or subscribe if you haven't already. I believe we're going to three times a week next week. So I know I tell you five times at the beginning, but that's just kind of, you know, the branding of all of this. I think we will be for the month of August back down to three. There's not a lot going on. However, I think there might be because there's still players who need to be traded across the NBA. The schedule's coming out. So, you know, bonus episodes galore, I'm sure. But that's the plan. Brandon and Steven will continue to be back. Just less of me by myself. So I will talk to you guys next week. Enjoy the weekend.